All right. Welcome in. Uh, now, I really thought my resume was good until I got handed the list of panelists that are sitting to my right. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Kaylin Kyle, former Canadian International Olympic bronze medalist. I'm going to turn this down so I stop here and myself. Olympic bronze medalist at... Can I give this to someone for a second? Sorry. Just echoing. Cheers. Thank you. Uh, Olympic bronze medalist played in two women's world cup and then also played over 101 times for Canada. Uh, again, my ego has been crushed here today. So without further ado, uh, to my right, Didier Drogba. As one of the most successful fo football players of all time, Drogba has earned worldwide acclimate both professionally, um, sportsman and champion for peace. From France to the UK to Turkey to Canada, he has received many honors throughout his career. Time magazine included him as the most, as in the list of 100 most influential people in the world. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to need a glass of water to keep going on all this. President of the Drogba Foundation, who Goodwill Ambassador for Sport and Health, board members of organizations, Drogba has been continuing to use his worldwide well-known name to impact positively. Thank you Thank for you. joining us. Uh, keep going down to our right. Uh, Amy Purdy, one of our next panelists, is a woman who has defined the odds throughout her life and overcome a near-death experience to accomplish some extraordinary things. She grew up with passion for snowboarding and dreamed of traveling the world. And despite obstacles that perhaps should have stopped her dead in her tracks, well, she went on to dance in Hollywood. She's also a best-selling author. And she and her husband also are co-founders of the nonprofit sport group Adept Action Sports, whose mission is to help people with permanent physical disabilities to find purpose, passion, and adventure in their own lives through action sport. Dr. Tedros. I was going to really try to pronounce your last name, but I really, oh, they're not even here. So join us. Okay. So this, you know what, this is a great thing for me. I can actually just skip the last name. They won't even know. Um, Dr. Tedros <laughs> was elected uh, WHO director for five years term by WHO member states at the 17th World Health Assembly in May of 2017. He was the first person from who Africa region to head the world's leading public health agency. He will be joining us in just a moment, or they will be joining us in just a moment. And as we move down, uh, Her Excell Excellency Dr. Hannah Mohammed Kuwari, Her Excellency was appointed as Qatar's Minister of Public Health in January 2016. She is also Managing Director of Hamad Medical Corporation, HMC, a position where she held since 2007. Her Excellency is a chairperson of numerous boards, including Academic Health System International Advisory Board, the Hamad Health Care Quality Institute International Advisory Board, and a number other of community, committees in Minister of Public Health. Ambassador Sidney Sidhu. Sidney Sadu was appointed French ambassador for global health in 2018, representing France within international health organizations. In her role, she contributes to the design of implementation, implementation of the French strategy for global health, which focuses on strengthening health systems, promoting equitable access, and with particular focus on gender on the most vulnerable groups. And then someone that won't be joining us today, but will be joining us via video is Mr. Gianni Infantino. Since his election of the extraordinary FIFA Congress in, 20, er, in February 2016, Gianni has focused on his presidency on repositioning FIFA on a credible, trustworthy, modern, professional, and accountable organization. Gianni's presidency has focused on bringing wide-ranging reforms of FIFA, expanding global participation in FIFA's flagship competitions, and boosting FIFA's investment in football development through the Forward Program. Gianni's long-term vision for FIFA to make football true global on leveling up playing and organizational standards across every continent and expanding participation in the world's most prestigious football competition, like the FIFA World Cup just happening around the corner in Qatar, and also the FIFA Women's World Cup in 2023 in both New Zealand and Australia. So thank you guys again for making me feel like I was through the roof today. And then I got here and I was like, wow, mm -hmm. you guys are true leaders in both sport on and off the pitch and global leaders as well. So shall we get to my hot seat questions? That's cool. Okay. Let's start with you. 
Uh, what is the link between sport and health? And what is the message you would like to give um, as your role for ambassador for both sport and health? Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's an honor for me to be here with you and uh, to talk about health and sport. Um, as a sportman, I think it's it's so important to to have both related. You know, you cannot perform at high level if you're not healthy. I think you've been you've been through it, and uh, it's um, it's an honor for me to be ambassador for WHO for sports and health. Health is important as a young age because it helps you to mentally be healthy. I mean, I can say that. And also it helps you to work on your cognitive, um, I don't know how to say that in English, in, um, as a kid, you know, you, you're improving all your cognitive, which is really important. And um, as you grow up, you become older, like I am getting, and I, as I retired from, from playing football, I need to keep staying active because um, it helps preventing post strokes, uh, cardiovascular disease. You know, it's so I'm really here to 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 spread the message. And uh, during this um, period of COVID that we had, I really noticed that the most healthy you are, the more active you are. Um, the more and the stronger you are and you can you can face the the this disease and and fight it we've got so many examples for example uh uh in football a lot of players a lot of teams a lot of leagues were playing during covid and and some players got uh they got covid mm -hmm. but they were coming back after two weeks or, or, or three weeks they were coming back on the pitch and playing so this is an example of the, the the importance of being active and and strengthening our human system i just want to say don't age us up here okay we're aging like a fine line uh that that is really interesting that you said that though because i thought when we retired from professional sport it meant i don't have to go to the gym seven days a week i don't have to watch my nutrition but it's actually the exact opposite it's crazy you miss maybe a training or you're not eating and how terrible you do feel the next day so <laughs> Thank you. It's true. Let's just be honest. Um, Amy, I want to jump over to you. What is the the role of sport in your life? And what is it for you that links sport and health? So sport specifically, snowboarding has played a huge role in my life. I grew up in Las Vegas, not exactly where you expect a professional <laughs> winter athlete to come from. Um, and I grew up actually without sports. I never played sports in my life, um, but my family skied and snowboarded and I fell in love with snowboarding at the age of 15. I knew it was something that I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And little did I know at that time, just how profound snowboarding would be in my life. Um, oh, I just got emotional, but at the age of 19, uh, my life changed forever when I contracted something called bacterial meningitis. I thought I had the flu one day. I was at work. I was a massage therapist. And uh, within 24 hours of my first flu-like symptom, I was in the hospital. I was on life support. I was given less than a 2% chance of living. It ended up not being the flu like we initially thought. It was bacterial meningitis, and we had no idea how I got it. But it changed my life forever. Over the course of two and a half months, I ended up losing um, my kidney function. I lost the hearing in my left ear. I lost my spleen. And due to the septic shock that my body went into, I ended up losing both of my legs below the knees. And I fought for my life. And so my life changed in an instant. And I had no idea what to expect. I had no idea what the quality of my life would be like. Uh, but the thing that got me through my darkest days was snowboarding because I was on a mission to be able to do it again. And there weren't any feet out there for snowboarding. There weren't any prosthetic legs out there for snowboarding at the time. So I had to make my own. I ended up making a pair of feet that I could snowboard in. Um, and once I realized that I could snowboard again, I felt so empowered and, and, and I felt so capable and that helped me feel confident in my life. And I was able to take that into every other part of my life. And my husband and I, we wanted to help others 
uh, live that type of quality of life as well. So we started a nonprofit organization called Adaptive Action Sports, where we get youth, young adults, and wounded veterans with permanent physical disabilities involved in action sports like snowboarding and skateboarding. We teach people with disabilities how to snowboard, um, but we also were a driving force in getting snowboarding into the Paralympic Games for the very first time, which happened in 2014. And I then went on to become a three-time Paralympic medalist, and that that platform took me to places that I never could have imagined. I ended up writing a best-selling book that's been written in 10 languages across the world, which is amazing. That's allowed me to connect with athletes all across the world. Um, did a speaking tour with Oprah and did Dancing with the Stars. And, you know, it really it all began with sport. And now with our organization, we train Paralympic hopefuls um, from all over the world who, who want to make the Paralympic Games. And so for me, the link between sport and health is profound. I went from losing my legs, being 83 pounds, being in full kidney failure, to going on to being the healthiest and strongest that I've ever been in my entire life. And that's because of sport. I feel like sport really has the ability to develop us into our best selves, not just physically, but mentally, emotionally, socially, even culturally. And um, I'm grateful that I've been able to experience it and, and help others do the same. See what I was telling you when you came into this room thinking that, you know, I'm doing a good job. And then these two step up here and have their spiel. No, honestly, what you guys have done both on and off the pitch, on and on the slopes is truly, truly inspiring. Uh, obviously, the, our head of FIFA is not here, but we do have a little video from him. So let's take a listen. Dear Dr. Tedros, dear dignitaries and delegates, dear friends, first of all, thank you for the invite to speak at your summit. I consider this as a recognition of the work FIFA has done with the World Health Organization through our Memorandum of Understanding, which uh, Dr. Tedros and I signed uh, three years ago. One of the key elements of my vision from 2020 to 2023 is to use football's unique power to spread positive messages. And health is an area where we can certainly do this. For example, the World Health Organization's uh, Sports and Health Program aims to raise awareness about the benefits of healthy lifestyles among 1 billion people and will use sports events to spread this message. I'm glad to say that uh, you will have the perfect opportunity to do this from 20th of November, as more than 5 billion people will tune in to watch the greatest show on earth, the FIFA World Cup. The FIFA World Cup will uh, inspire people around the world to play more football and to be more active. Throughout the tournament, FIFA and its partners will uh, run a campaign to try and get people moving, particularly young people who may be watching their first ever FIFA World Cup and are particularly vulnerable to inactivity. This will be part of our healthy FIFA World Cup 2022 campaign together with the World Health Organization and the Qatari Ministry of Public Health. In addition, Healthy food options will be available for spectators in and around FIFA World Cup Stadium. The lessons that uh, we learned from uh, the COVID-19 pandemic will be put to good use and will implement measures to keep players, officials and the public safe. Measures we believe can be used as a blueprint for future major sporting events. We will ensure the right of spectators to breathe clean air uncontaminated by carcinogens and other harmful substances, thanks to our FIFA event policy for tobacco, which follows World Health Organization recommendations. We intend to make the FIFA World Cup 2022 not only the best ever, but also the healthiest. I wish you all a very successful summit and I look forward to seeing you 
soon. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you so much, Gianni, for that wonderful video into insight of what is going to go on in and around the World Cup. Thank you for joining us. And thank you for not making me have to say your last name. That's why you were late, correct? Not to put me in the hot seat. Now I can put you in the hot seat. I will teach you. It's easy. <laughs> Perfect. Well, I want to jump back and just ask you a, a quick question just to tie in uh, what both Amy and Drogba just alluded to earlier on. Um, for you, how is sport and health connected and why who created a sport and health initiative? I would have preferred to listen first, but you're putting me on the spot. <laughs> I love putting people on the hot seat. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I think, um, uh, imagine the FIFA president now, I don't know, you, you, know you, you have already heard to him, you would expect this some years ago. He, he was talking like WHO, Gianni, in his, in his address, in his message. So you can you can see my my the question you uh, you asked is actually already answered. Um, but to say maybe a few words, uh, as you know, um, the root causes of some of the root causes of ill health. One of the risks is lack of physical activity, okay. and people. Um, suffer from non-communicable diseases because of many reasons, but one, and the major one is lack of physical activity. Um, but at the same time, many actually, like football, if you take, um, it has many funds. And when the World Cup is happening, billions, billions watch. Um, and um my brother is is here how many followers he has how many fans he has so there are two things here one we use the platform and tell people not only to watch but to be active yeah. because it's very important for for their health but the second part is when we say that since they may not listen to us we have the influencers the athletes themselves telling them. Um, so, like my brother Drogba, if he says it, many followers, they will trust him. And, um, uh, you know, uh, we will be physically we're physically active. So that's why we want the sports and, and health as, as uh, one project uh, to promote health. And for... Uh, you know, WHO's plan for the next five years, if there is one thing um, that we will focus is on promoting health, addressing the risk factors. Because the ill health is in the food we eat, in the environment we live, we live in, in, in um, uh, you know, our behavior like alcohol, tobacco, and, and so on, and the uh, inactivity, which is the physical inactivity, so if we address those root causes, we will move from sick care into health care. Mm -hmm. That's from uh, managing disease to promoting health, to helping people to live a healthy lifestyle. And sport is really central, and that's why. So the partnership, not only with FIFA, uh, we are partnering for this World Cup with, with Qatar, and uh, Minister al Qari is very active. And this project will be tested for the first time uh, next month. Mm -hmm. And it's not about physical inactivity only, by the way. The platform can be used, as um, Gianni was saying, to help people take care of their diet. I think it's so important that you've touched on that because you can work out as much as you want, but everything comes down to nutrition, what you're putting in your body to fuel it in the right ways to be able to do whatever you need to do, be a parent, be a professional athlete, to be now a spokesperson, to lead all these initiatives that you guys are doing. See, you manage my hot seat question real good. Thank you for joining us. Uh, moving on uh, to Her Excellency, I want to ask you, the state of Qatar has entered into a partnership with WHO and FIFA to host a safe and healthy World Cup. What does it entail and how are the plans progressing? 
Thank you very much. First, I'm really honored and pleased to be here with my esteemed colleagues and to address this really important topic, which is the link between sports and health. And the links are innumerable. Um, uh, we started a discussion with WHO around how to make this FIFA World Cup a healthy World Cup. And we were really pleased that the WHO has reached an agreement with the FIFA, which enabled us then to have a tripartite agreement between the Ministry of Public Health, um, WHO and uh, FIFA. Our aim is to make this a healthy World Cup. So what does that mean? Our first objective is A, to make sure that we have um, a secure uh, World Cup. So health security is really important, especially now coming out of COVID. And um, we have really good experience with hosting mega sport events. And the WHO has really good experience in hosting mega sport events. So combining our, our talents together means that we could set this up as a model to have uh, health security during uh, events. Our second objective was to have a healthy World Cup, meaning the event itself is healthy. So we know very well that athletes are really healthy. They eat really well, they, they do sports, but that does not reflect in um, the sport events and the visitors. So working with WHO, we are ensuring, and with the FIFA, we're ensuring that there are healthy food options, that there are activities that are healthy up, um, so that the visitors can benefit of activity, physical activity, um, and health and well-being during the, um, uh, the, the events. And our third objective was the health promotion element, which is really important, sending uh, public health messages, health messages on how to be, uh, how to remain healthy and how to be act healthy, both to the local community and to the international community, the uh, millions of people who will be watching this on television. And uh, then the final objective was to build a legacy um, of uh, uh, protocols, advice, of material that can be used in future sporting events so that all um, uh, sport events in the future are healthy sport events. Um, it is a shame that the athletes are very healthy and the visitors do not get that same uh, messaging uh, from us. Um, and then um, the Healthy um, World Cup is an integral part of our national health strategy. Our national health strategy and our Qatar Vision 2030 um, uh, uh, aims for a healthy population. So hosting a healthy World Cup comes naturally with the desire to have a healthy population. Um, one of the activities in the buildup of the World Cup is um, uh, we have uh, been accredited by the WHO um, to be a healthy city, uh, but not just for one municipality, but every municipality in Qatar now has been accredited as a healthy city. That means that our local residents and the visitors coming will be able to benefit from healthy uh, communities so green areas uh, to walk, healthy food options, and uh, we'll be able to enjoy a healthy country as they visit us. It's truly inspiring. I mean, I just got back from there and you can already see those plans being implemented. And it was very interesting, Dr. Tedros, you just touched on it, using people, former players, former athletes to really lead that initiative, because nowadays it's very much driven by social media. You watch your favorite football, your favorite snowboarder, your favorite leaders, and see what they're doing. So I, I love that you're able to tie this all together. Stephanie, I didn't forget about you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do uh, want to touch on obviously Paris 2024 coming up just around the corner in the Olympic Games. What do you guys have going on there and to tie all of this in together? So it's absolutely going to be an inspiration to follow up on the Qatar, the FIFA in the World Cup. Uh, FIFA Qatar WHO partnership uh, around the, the World Cup. So definitely objectives which are going to be extremely similar. What stage are we at right now? So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how we started with building up to the, uh, the, 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 the Paris Games in 2024, well, actually beefing up our national policies, because as Dr. Chedras mentioned and the speakers before me, indeed it is um, our own individual um, responsibility to remain healthy. It is also that of uh, amazing leaders, such as the ones on this panel, the athletes, also the uh, organizations, but also the governments. And so France has decided to actually use this opportunity of the uh, 2024 games in order to beef up our national policies and have national strategies in order to help all our citizens, well, possibly become more of a um, sporting nation and not just a nation that loves sport. Although, I mean, sport is is, is dynamic in France. I'm not saying that. But uh, really making sure, and as Didier Drogba said, the pandemic showed how important our health capital is 
psychologically as well as physiologically. So that's uh, a direction we're going on. And just let me quote two examples from that strategy. One is, and that is such a breakthrough, and I'm so thrilled about this, is now sports on prescription. So now um, a physician can prescribe sport as a measure of prevention, even in wow. uh, um, in the case of uh, remission from, from uh, serious diseases. And that is taken care of by our public national health insurance. So that's, um, and it's, it's in its early stages. And the other one is to promote um, health and sports houses. Sorry, I have to check the, the translation in England, in English, uh, in, in very many of our, our territories. And the idea there is to really reach out to those who have, dropped out of sports, who aren't accessing sport because of social inequalities or because simply they, sports has simply dropped out of their scope of vision. So this is a, um, and our last, uh, the last focus is definitely going to be on children and adolescents because there is an unfortunate realization that amongst those who are actually dropping out of sports, we have the adolescent population, particularly girls. So uh, the need for there to be a particular focus on that. Um, and that's definitely one of the legacies we hope to leave after the Paris 2024 Olympic and Paralympic Games on our own population, that adolescents are actually um, encouraged. And this is starting now with the Ministry of Education to add to the usual sport activities in the school curriculum at least 30 minutes of exercise per day. So this is going through all our all our, our schools. So sorry to have started with what we're doing in France about this, but I think it's quite important to mm -hmm. actually build the base for there to be a collective appropriation of what will be going on. And as you said, Minister, it's mm -hmm. such an event as the Paris 2024 has to uh, definitely benefit the population. So, of course, this is about the French uh, population. What we really would hope is for this to mm. connect now at another level and uh, French authorities stand ready to partner with, obviously, WHO mm. and taking up from the president of the World Cup in Qatar in order to indeed follow up with uh, what will have been put in place in order to organize um, healthy events. And maybe a little later, I have a few exciting uh, things to say about nutrition during the uh, 2024 event. I, I, I would love to hear about that because my nutrition right now since retiring is not the best. So we'll definitely get back to that one. But I love that you touched on leaving a mark on whether it's the Olympic Games or World Cup, being someone in 2015 where Canada hosted the Women's World Cup. It was so important to leave that landmark for kids to not only get to the games and be inspired by the athletes, but also say, I may not be a professional athlete, but being involved in sport, being involved in health and wellness can really make me a well-rounded individual and just be a good human at the end of the day. So I love those initiatives around Paris 2024. Minister, I want to jump back to you. Um, change of kind of pace a little bit, but there's been some criticism um, in relation to migrant workers in and around Qatar. What are you guys doing uh, over there just to kind of work those out? Um, thank you very much for asking this question. Um, uh, some of this criticism, and indeed a lot of this criticism is unfair and uh, un un unjustified. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, what we do in Qatar around the health care of everybody living in Qatar. So for starters, um, we take the health care and well-being of everyone living in Qatar and working in Qatar very seriously. We, are, um, we have 100% universal health coverage. So whoever is working in Qatar, regardless of economic status, regardless of post, regardless of employment contract, they have free access to health care, um, all the way from emergency to tertiary, uh, a state-of-the-art tertiary care. So uh, the health care provided to our migrant workers is excellent, uh, to all our workers and our residents. Um, uh, in addition, we have a number of programs that focus on occupational health. And um, uh, we've initiated that with our new, with our Qatar national strategy. We reach out to all employers to make sure they have a strong occupational health programs to keep their employees safe um, uh, and in good health. Uh, we also have an annual health check, which is mandatory to everyone. Um, uh, one of the initiatives that was taken by the Supreme Committee um, in preparing for the World Cup was to actually link through an information system, uh, all the uh, health okay. workers, all the, all the um, uh, uh, workers that work on these sites so that they can um, monitor their health regardless of which site they're working on. And that has been extremely helpful during COVID where we could immediately identify um, individuals that are considered high risk 
um, so people with chronic conditions and so on, and work specifically on early vaccination um, uh, for them and um, uh, uh, isolation work conditions and so on. Um, uh, uh, in addition, of course, uh, in Qatar, all vaccines are free, including the COVID vaccine was free to all our workers. Um, uh, so I think that in terms of uh, healthcare and well-being of, of uh, uh, migrant workers, um, uh, uh, the situation in Qatar is extremely uh, good, and uh, it is it is the same for whatever level of employment you are and whatever economic background you have from. Perfect. Thank you so much for answering that question. Um, now I have some more visual stuff that we can look at. Here's a little video on physical activity with who. You know this moment. Well, forget all that. Get out on that skateboard from 10 years ago. Break out that lucky bat. Do... Yeah, I guess, do that. Do it badly, do it awkwardly. Do it your own way. The point is, get moving. For you and your health. Yeah, that'll do it. I was going to get everyone to stand up and maybe get moving and dancing here, but it is hot. So let's just get everyone sitting. We don't need to sweat any further. I do want to ask both of you, since retiring, how have you been able to stay active and mentally switched on? Because I know there's a period of time when a professional athlete does retire. And the last thing you want to do is go to the gym and maybe lift weights or maybe play a pickup game on a Friday. I haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> I retired last year and it is, it's really interesting because sport is just so it, it's, it drives you. It's what you wake up for every day. It's what gets you in the gym every day. And you know that if you're not working hard, then your competitor is working harder. And so um, to try to find that level of drive in your day-to-day -day life is, is actually really challenging. Like, okay, you just have to force yourself to go to the gym instead of having, you know, medals that you're trying to win. So I can definitely say I'm still trying to figure out the balance from a professional athlete to retired athlete. Well, I agree with you. <laughs> I'm, I'm it's right. supposed to be inspiring. Yeah. We were just at the gym actually before we got in yeah. here. No, it's, it's so important to 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 be honest and and tell the truth and about how we feel because when you retire and I retired four years ago, uh, the first year I didn't want to have anything to do with running football <laughs> obviously when i was when i was playing i hate running i hated running <laughs> which is strange but to run after a result or to chase the ball is is one thing but to be running in a treadmill or, wow it's very difficult very difficult and i think a lot of people can relate uh but because i stopped playing every three days for the past 20 years, and this is not good, but I could put, I could eat anything mm -hmm. because my health was good. You know, I could really burn all these calories, all these um, bad food sometimes that I could I could, I could allow that. myself to 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 eat. But now I need to be careful about my diet. I need to be a bit more regular in the gym. When I was playing, I was never going to the gym. Mm. I was lucky to have natural, uh, um, uh, to be good naturally and 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 a good physique. So now I need to pay attention to all of this, and it's 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 been difficult. Sometimes, you know, the the, the old injuries are coming back. So you can, yeah, so you cannot train for a certain time, and and this is why you need to be careful because I've put on weight, I put on like five kilos. So I'm going back to the gym again. You've been there, I guess. No, never. No. Seven days a week. Seven days a week. No. Throw me under the bus. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's very difficult. It's very difficult. But again, it, it takes us back to the importance of sport activity and, and a healthy diet. Because it's without that, it will be difficult. And, and I want to be able to, to, to enjoy my kids, spend time yeah. with them, run with them. They they start challenging me. They watch me playing and score goals, so they still think that that is the same as twenty years ago, which is not true. But it's it's I mean just for me and to feel good. 
Yeah, that's my excuse. I chase my four-year-old and my two-year-old around the house. So that is my seven-day-a-week regime yeah. at the moment. <laughs> I do eat well. Um, I do want to open it up to uh, you guys just to ask any questions in and around the physical aspect and physical education that we've all been talking around here. Thank you so much. Can I actually ask about mental health as well as physical health? Well, we are, we're going to get to mental health. That, should I hold it then? You know what? You need to come and be the chair because you're just taking my job at the moment. Yeah, hold that question because we are going to end with the mental health aspect of Fantastic. everything. Yeah. So we're going to stick to physical um, health at the moment. Sure. Anyone on physical health? Yes. We'll come back to you with that question. I promise. You'll be my first question. Everyone. Um, my name is Nema Lugangir. I'm a member of parliament from Tanzania. And I must say, I'm kind of starstruck. My son told me, make sure you get a picture with Drogba. <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm calming my nerves right now. Um, but I congratulate WHO for this initiative and definitely bringing on board athletes. I just wanted to ask on how do we take this forward to the communities? Because I come from Kagera. It's a peripheral region. Um, we have youngsters there who have potential in sports, but not necessarily in our public schools, we have sports um, as, in, as, a, as an extracurricular activity. So I just wanted to know um, what are the plans towards making this impactful and taking it to the communities? Thank you. Who wants to kick this one off? Amy? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, so there's an obvious link between health and sport, but there's a huge missing link, which is funding. And, and whether it's a program like what we have, which is a high level um, sports performance program, or it's a community based program, just giving access to athletes of all abilities uh, to be able to compete or be able to participate in sports. I think the, the, the link that's missing is funding. And so I, um, I don't, it's different everywhere in the world. I know in the U S our government doesn't, uh, doesn't contribute really to sport organizations financially. We, we get our funding through corporations and through donors and basically people who want Want to um, who who see the benefit in what we're doing? We're relying on on people's generosity <laughs> to be able to help us uh, with our organization. But I think depending on where you're from around the world, I think it's it's so important. We need to somehow we need to let our government and our uh, and our corporations see that sport is not just a recreational activity, but it's a priority and necessity in building um, a, a skill set that we can use throughout our entire lives. So I think there needs to be put, uh, more priority put on sport. And, and we really need to be knocking down the doors of our government and our corporations and our medical institutions so that sport can be looked at as uh, so much more than just a recreational activity. Um, I'm happy also to make a comment here, some examples from what we're doing in Qatar around this. Um, uh, so we have a number of initiatives that bring um, uh, physical activity closer to the community first. A few years ago, His Highness uh, started a national day for sports. So it's a paid day off for everybody to go and do sports. Mm -hmm. And the message behind this is that sports is really important, that government is willing to pay everyone a day off to do sports. And there's a number of sport activities organized across the country, um, indoors and outdoors, on that day, and everybody is encouraged to participate. Uh, uh, so that's one activity at the, at the leadership level, which is very important and has truly changed the culture. We see it since we started our sports day, um, or the first day where people were unable really to participate actively in sports because they were not fit and they didn't have a hobby, whereas now they're actively seeking, actively participating, and, um, and they're very excited about uh, uh, the, that day off. Mm -hmm. Another initiative is over the last few years, as part of our national health strategy, we've converted our primary care centers from being your traditional uh, primary care center to being a wellness center. So what does that mean? Um, that means all our primary health centers now have a gym in them, and they also have a swimming pool. And you are encouraged, as uh, the members of the community are encouraged to uh, join the gym and uh, and and uh, and uh, and go to the pool free of charge. Um, uh, and the doctor, our our, our our physical wellness doctor, also prescribes 
um, uh, uh, sports for them. Uh, so this is in addition to the physiotherapy that's there because they might not be well enough to go to the gym. They'll start first in the physiotherapy program and then they'll transfer uh, to the gym program. And we have those across the whole country. We have a network of 23 primary health centers and, and they all have pools and, um, and gym activities in them. And that's such a great question as well. And you guys answered it brilliantly because it's not about being a professional athlete. It's about moving. It's about making that communication with others. And I think sport helps you not only be a well-rounded individual, but gives you that confidence you might not have if you don't have that group to go to. So um, yeah, right here, the second row, the gentleman. Thank you very much. I'm Mehdi Abdel Karim, psychiatrist from Iraq. I will not ask about mental space. <laughs> yes, <laughs> no, we're saving that. We're saving that. Okay. I will ask uh, Her Excellency, uh, Dr. Hanna, uh, how do you overcome the social restrictions about uh, um, female uh, practicing exercise and so on? Okay. Thank you. Well, um, uh, alhamdulillah, we have a very enlightened uh, leadership in the country. And our women are very active in sports. We have our own uh, women athlete clubs. Our women um, uh, do public, in public sports, and, act, and, and, um, uh, um, and they're really role models of sports. Um, and even in the sports day, our leaders actually do sports in public and, and, and encourage everyone else to do sports. And we have a, a, a school activities. So children um, in a primary, secondary school are encouraged to do sports and, uh, and there are clubs. Uh, uh, and, and we have a very, a very active uh, female uh, um, or women's athletic uh, uh, community. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you. Right here, second row. Can I ask a question with regards to reproductive health or we're coming to that? The which, sorry? I want to ask a question in regards to reproductive health. Is it okay at this point? Um, yeah. <laughs> if, it's, if the question's not, I'm going to say no after. So how about it? My, my question will go to Drogba. So uh, I'm Fatma Dakasama. I come from the Gambia. And you have a lot of fans in the Gambia. Mm -hmm. And we, I work with uh, an organization. We... Uh, raise awareness about sexual and reproductive health. And we know uh, it is a taboo in our communities. So for us to be able to eradicate this taboo, we involve adolescent boys and men in our education activities. So, and I am particularly interested in this uh, session because we are working on how to use sport and then advocate for women's sexual and reproductive health. So we educate boys and men and they become the advocates. So um, I landed in your foundation, you do women empowerment. So I wanted to know as a WHO ambassador and a role model to many young men and adolescent boys in the Gambia, are you using your capacity and platform to raise awareness about sexual and reproductive health? Because we cannot achieve gender equality uh, when we don't involve adolescent boys and men. Mrs. Stadu, Mrs. Stadu, this is a lot of pressure. Just my enthusiasm for the question. No, 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 no. It's, it's, uh, it's to you. It's addressed to all of us. No, first of all, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy, and I feel blessed to have a lot of fans in 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 Gambia. And really, I would be very, very happy to use my name, my fame, to help spread a good message to to and of, of awareness and and to try to educate all these boys and girls and and I'm here to contribute. So I don't know how we can we can do that, but with my my foundation is true that we we are very active in women empowerment and this could be something very interesting to to look at. I think that's the one of the best things about you, both not only what you did on the pitch, obviously that speaks for itself, but what you do off the pitch, not only for the men's side of things, but also for the the women advocates, someone being a female soccer player and then trying to come into the the men's world of covering a men's World Cup, men's football. Um, it's people like you that allow us to be able to come and feel comfortable within these jobs. So, um, yeah, I'm sure he would be great for that. Of course. Yes. Um, any one more question before we move on to nutrition? <laughs> uh, let's go back that back row there. 
Thank you very much. My name is Judith Cosmas from Tanzania. I'm a pediatrician. So I have interest in, in children. And what I'm, I want to ask is, with this very important move on sports and health, how are we considering children with disabilities? How are we taking them abroad? Sorry, I can't. Um, how are you taking the approach with children with disabilities? So this might be something that you- can... As far as um, getting them involved in mm -hmm. sport, um, I, you question. know, and I think um, that's where the importance of uh, supporting and funding organizations um, it comes from and, and, and where it's really needed because there's a lot of organizations across the world that support um, children with disabilities, but they don't necessarily have the funding. And there's a lot of organizations that want to get started that also don't have the funding. So I think it's, you know, it's looking into your communities and seeing what organizations exist. Uh, it, it all it all starts with our children and it i know we're going to go into the mental health side but it's incredible what uh, how you develop as a human when you play sports when it, it when you're working together it's uh you're challenging yourself it's teamwork it's you develop these skills that you can take throughout your entire life so i think it's incredibly important whether you have a disability or uh, not to um to participate in sport and so we really need to look at the organizations that already exist that are looking for the funding to be able to get into our communities more um, or uh, try to find the funding to start the organizations so that so that they can work with more children with disabilities. And in the U.S., there's there's a select uh, different kind of organizations that do work on different levels with children with disabilities. But I don't know if the importance of sports has really been brought to light. It's always looked at as recreational, as I mentioned before. I don't know if it's really been even in the U.S. looked at as this is so important to developing this person into the best human they could be. And um, and I feel like the more energy we can put in that direction across the world, the better. That got me emotional. Um, but yeah, you've, <laughs> you've nailed everything from children with disabilities to children with Down syndrome. I mean, there is yeah. so many programs within the United States and in Canada, I can't speak on Europe, but um, that are helping those kids not only be an Olympian, but also just be a good human at the end of the day, because we need more good humans in this world. Yeah. Um, let's move on to nutrition. Mental health's coming. Don't worry. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, and just how important it is. Here's a little video. I'm Aisha. And let me tell you, I am amazing at football. Like, I was playing last weekend, and I scored 1,000 goals. Here's my secret. It's by eating healthy food. It gives me my football superpowers. So it's good for my heart, and my bones, and my brain. And that's going to be really important to the start of my journey. Winning the World Cup, the Champions League, the Ballon d'Or, the Euros. Hmm. I wish my kids were like this. I put vegetables on their plate and they're like, absolutely not. Um, Stephanie, let's jump over to you and what the initiatives you guys are doing around Paris 2024 in and around the stadiums and in and around uh, France. Okay, I'm going to read my notes for this because I don't, I don't want to forget anything because it this all sounds so exciting. Don't but... tell anyone that. No one knows that you're reading your notes. <laughs> no, I, am. I am. No, but just to say that, uh, well, at the beginning of it is a real, real push to be coherent and mm -hmm pay attention to nutrition and to, to the quality of food and to the waste. So there'll be 13, an estimated 13 million meals and snacks that will be served during Paris 2024. And so we've made six commitments about this. There will be twice as much fruit and vegetable um, plates um, uh, on the plates, zero food waste, so we'll be uh, sizing the quantities and recovering 100% of the food resources so that uh, we aim at dividing by two the average carbon footprint of the plate during the games. The third um, commitment is that 100% certified food to guarantee the origin and quality of products. There'll be 80% supply from France and 25% um, will, will come from less than 20 
250 kilometers from the competition site, 100% responsible fishing, 100% French dairy products. Half as much single-use plastic in the catering industry, so we'll be reusing 100% of the dishes for the on-site catering. 100% of the equipment will be already existing or reused, so we won't be creating any new so, and, and unnecessary structures. So that's for the athletes. Uh, the dishes that they will eat will be created in collaboration with top French uh, chefs, such as Thierry Marx. And finally, um, at least 10% of the jobs in the catering sector will be offered to people who find it difficult to be employed, people with disabilities or people from priority neighborhoods. And finally, because France is a country of gastronomy, um, each um, host territory will be highlighted in, in the restaurants. So welcome to Paris uh, 2024 Olympic and Paralympic Games. I hope the food will be up to standards. I just want to say you're making me want to come out of retirement. That's because I was just going to say. One of 12, the amount of times I walked by the McDonald's and the Athlete Village and we ended up making it so far in the tournament, I never got to enjoy it. And it would, it killed me. It did kill me. So um, I want to actually touch on that. How difficult was it for someone like you when you were at these Paralympic Games to eat properly? Yeah, really challenging. And that's what I was just thinking too. I was like, gosh, this makes me want to come out of retirement. There's going to be a French <laughs> chef. Like that's <laughs> incredible. Um, it is really hard. I mean, there is, it is interesting. The athletes village is very cool in the sense that they do try to make it as global as possible. And so you've got, uh, I know that when I competed in Korea, we had, you know, a Korean food station and then we had a Japanese food station and American food station. But so I, I do feel like the last Paralympic games that I competed at was good. Um, I heard Heard that the the past one just last year in China wasn't as good, but probably also because of COVID, so limited resources. But um, it's interesting because you would think as athletes we would be fed the best, but not necessarily. You have to really advocate for yourself and seek it out. And nutrition is so important. I didn't become physically the strongest that I had been in my career until I started eating proper. Um, it's incredible. You think that working out does it. You think, you know, that we focus on the physical so much. We don't realize how important nutrition is. And I had, um, I had a severe injury to my arms at one point to the muscle fibers in my arms. After I, I overdid a workout, it actually broke down the muscle fibers in my arms. And I was in the hospital for eight days and I ended up doing this eight month recovery, trying to come back from it. And I just couldn't quite get back. I wasn't building the muscle I needed to. And I ended up seeing a nutritionist who was saying, you know, you're, you're actually, you're just not eating enough. You're, you're eating too clean. You're eating too many vegetables. You really need to be eating way more protein than what you are. And so right away, I started eating a lot more calories, a lot more protein, and it instantly turned this injury around. And then I went back and competed and won two medals in the Paralympic games right after that. And it all comes back to nutri nutrition. Mm -hmm. So um, this is obviously something that's really important, not just in sports, but in health in general. And I think, I just think it's amazing what, um, what you're doing, what both of you guys are doing with these big sporting events, because just like you said, with, um, you know, here, the athletes who are competing are hopefully eating well, but then you've got the people in the stands exactly. who are just eating, you know, in the U S it's just nachos and hot dogs. <laughs> and so that's, you know, there's a whole way of trying to get it into every part of a sport environment where it's really important. So. It, it's, it's crazy. Like as being a professional athlete, again, nutrition didn't come in, I think until 2011 for me, right before 2012 Olympic games. And I always thought I was fit, fast and strong. I mean, I was the, could run the beep test. I don't know if you guys have the beep test here. I was always one of the last ones. And then I started eating properly mm -hmm. and I was finishing the beep test. And I was like, I haven't changed anything. I'm just eating better. So it is. Yeah crazy if you start do start eating clean whether you're a professional athlete or you know a doctor or a mom or a nurse um just how good your body does feel uh, i do want to open it up to you guys again um if there's any questions on nutrition for any of our panels yeah just there in the back sorry thank you. it's working yeah sorry um i just had a question about uh, nutrition because often we talk about uh, strictly healthy food with mainly vegetables and fruits, but we often rely on proteins for the health and uh, everything. And I was asking what could be done in promoting some 
um, plant-based diets inside food because it's linked also with environmental health and it's sometimes put on the side when we look only with uh, sports that uh, we need to get the proteins and I was just wondering what could be done to maybe uh, put an impulse on that. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, what we're doing in partnership with WHO and FIFA for this World Cup in Qatar um, is um, we've uh, this, or negoti we've negotiated that thirty percent of the food that will be offered will be uh, healthy options, and that includes vegetarian options because we have a very large community that is asking for vegetarian food. And, and they often don't have good options. Having the right option for vegetarians is really important. But the thing that's important, and that's why the health messaging and health promotion is important, because at the end of the day, these are commercial and business decisions. If we do not um, educate the public and build awareness of how important healthy choices are, and if the public does not go and buy the healthy options, then the businesses will revert back to providing unhealthy options. So the health messaging is really important. WHO is investing a lot in health promotion and messaging. We're investing a lot during this World Cup on health investment, um, on health messaging. And it's important that we all together work at uh, educating the public so they make the right choices and influence then the businesses and, um, and uh, uh, the commercial side of things. Because at the end of the day, it's a commercial decision. We may say choose the healthy options, but if the people do not choose the healthy options, the businesses will revert back. I feel like I know this is for all of you, but I it's really making me want to come out of retirement. Being a vegetarian, <laughs> I'm like, well, I'm going to France. I'm going to Qatar. I mean, this is going to be amazing. Um, any more questions from any of you on nutrition? Oh, just one second. We'll grab you a mic just because there's people tuning in. Thank you. I just wanted to add that on nutrition, I see that um, football teams abroad take nutrition very seriously and they even have nutritionists part of their teams. But food, football teams um, in most African countries, at least also in Tanzania, they do not take the issue of nutrition seriously and they tend not even have a nutritionist for the for the football team. So I'm just wondering with WHO and FIFA partnership, is there a way to also kind of force them to take um, to take seriously the issue <laughs> issue of nutrition as part of the process somehow or, or, or to educate the football mm -hmm. teams through FIFA that the importance of them also having on board nutrition? Who wants to take this one? Yeah, right. yeah. of course. Um, I think it, it has to to do with the with the context, and you see the difference. Um, I'm from Ivory Coast. I played in Europe in 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 many teams, and we take the diet very seriously because it improves your performance. And if you if you don't, like one manager used to say to me, there is all kinds of food there. You decide what you want to eat. But if you don't perform, there's somebody else as good as you who will take your place. So you know that diet is important to avoid, to avoid injuries and to, to perform better. So you can keep your, your, your place in the starting 11, for example. But in Africa, I think the, the, the problems, are, problems are so difficult. Players, first of all, they don't get paid like in Europe. So for them, it's, it's not uh, having a career, it's surviving. So basically right now they're surviving, but we need more people trying to build a career abroad and come back to the country and, and, and help them to, to improve. And uh, that's what I've been trying to do. Um, coming back in Ivory Coast and trying to support all these kids with, uh, uh, all these kids who want to play football and who are playing at kind of professional level, but they're really not, they're not prof really professionals yet. You know, they're like amateur trying to become professionals and make it to Europe. So the, the, we're trying to spread messages saying that you need to, to eat healthy. You need to have some sleeves, you know, you need to, have, need to have a good recovery. But when these kids are fighting to have just one food a day, one meal a day, it's difficult for us to 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 speak about um, about about healthy food, you know. So there's realities that are different. Of course, we're trying our best to 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 change things, but it takes time. 
and that's why I think it's very important to have the 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 the, the implication of the of governments, of ministers of education, of 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 private sectors, you know, to to help them be in a better environment so they can focus on they can make the difference when you speak about food, lack of performance, healthy food, better performance, so better quality uh, for 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 the clubs. Any more questions on nutrition? Yeah, right here. Thank you very much. I'm Jimmy from Uganda. How do you deal with uh, the big companies, I won't mention names, who support sports events, but they have unhealthy foods or drinks? Who wants to take this one? <laughs> you know, it's an interesting one because I, I was um, sponsored by a huge organization that um, that supports the, or not organization, but corporation that supports the Olympic and Paralympic Games. And they are definitely globally not known for having um, healthy food or drinks. Um, but I also, um, as I as I connected with them more, I realized what they are doing and how much they do support health in the community. They, I think, they're aware that they um, that that they weren't known for healthy. Um, you know, healthy products. At the same time, they contributed a lot of money into nu nutrition, into local communities, and um, and so for me as a professional athlete, I you know I was I was able to work with them, knowing what they are doing that's positive, positive. Um, and uh, and they they contributed so much around the world actually in such a positive way that that I was able to work with them in that way. Had they have not brought that to the table though, I don't think I would have been, you know, comfortable representing that. So I do think that these days I would hope that most of these larger corporations that are supporting at least the Olympic and Paralympic games do have, uh, you know, a huge part of them that is contributing in a positive way. Okay, one last one there and just think third, fourth row. Hi, um, so I'm from the International Pharmaceutical Students Federation. Um, so my question is around, I guess, physical health and nutrition. So a lot of what's been discussed is mostly around Europe or in Canada and the US. So I guess this question is for Dr. Tedros is, what are the plans from WHO after the World Cup in Qatar to implement the linkage of sports and health globally, including LMIC, where funding might be the biggest obstacle to reach such, you know, successful levels as has been in Qatar. Thank you. No, thank you. Uh, of course, we're starting with uh, FIFA, and this is the first of its kind in um, uh, Qatar. Uh, we have signed the agreement with FIFA uh, more than two years ago now, three years. Uh, this is a new partnership, by the way, uh, but it will not stop there. Um, we have regional uh, football associations, almost all regions. Uh, we have football federations at country level. Um, and if there is going to be impact, the most important is actually at the country level. So they will learn from the practice, the global practice, which is starting now. Then based on the country situation, you know, tailored to, to their situation, they can have their own ways of address, addressing whether it's nutrition or or, or uh, other other things, uh, but it will not stop in in Qatar. It will, um, uh, you know, be and you know roll down to uh, country level, and countries. Of course, they will not expect everything to be told from the headquarters or from the. I mean, from the global level, they will have their own ways uh, of doing it. The key thing is, though, we don't need to tell them what to do. They can learn from the practice. What we would like to do is to encourage them to take ownership. That's the most important. So each and every football federation taking ownership and the regional also taking ownership. Then there will be many uh, ways to address the the challenges and have uh, safe and also uh, healthy 
um, World Cup or regional cup or even a country level uh, cup. Um, but in addition to that, not only FIFA, we have a relationship also with I, I, I also the International Olympic Committee. And we need to mobilize the other um, you know, sporting events as well. And through that, we, you know, the reach will be, the outreach will be really uh, big and, 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 and massive. But for any type of uh, uh, whatever uh, global entities we use, it's the local counterpart or the countries themselves, the governments, the civil society, the private sector at the country level, we can, which can, who can uh, make a difference. So that's what we're uh, planning to do. And we have already uh, started. And um, I hope this will have a, a, a major uh, impact. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Tedros. Uh, now moving on to the mental health side of things. I think it's the one thing that we don't talk about enough. We talk about physical, we talk about the nutritional side of it. And I think now, uh, since my playing days anyways, uh, I'm glad that it's starting to be the norm of a conversation. So here's a little video on the mental aspect. So depression for me felt like this negative energy that was really heavy inside of me. When I describe my anxiety, for me it's a massive tightening of the chest. Having ADHD, it's like voices just screaming for my attention constantly. I just knew I had to put my hand up and reach for help. The effects of playing sports, it's such a freeing experience. Every time I finish practice, I feel more happy. It calms my mind and helps me to live the life that I want to live.
why the sport and health is key. These platforms, these sporting platforms, draw billions of people. So the messages we pass then could help in, you know, creating demand from the people. Um, and it's only because people don't talk about it, mm -hmm. but the magnitude of the problem is so big. It was huge before the pandemic, but it was neglected. And it's even now bigger a problem during this pandemic. The last two, three years, people have lost their loved ones. People have lost their livelihood, lost their jobs. Imagine how many people experienced isolation. Yeah. It, all the combination of factors that could affect mental health. And some estimates show that before pandemic and now during this pandemic, it's not yet over, the increase in mental health problems is more than 25%. This is big. So since the magnitude is, is already huge, and we had actually a, what we call it a backlog, and then there is more problem. So this is a timely one. How do we use the sports events that draws billions of people to really understand in our messaging and, and so on? So they can they can demand. People are fixated to watch um, uh, Drogba play uh, <laughs> and maybe many of his fellows, uh, his uh, fans, uh, had probably <laughs> a lot of... Uh, <laughs> Depression when you miss it. <laughs> I think one that's why I try not to miss too much. <laughs> and anyway, so that's it. Billions are watching. Messages could go to the billions. The demand should come. It, and every citizen should, should start to speak. And the pressure could help actually governments to, to, do, to do something. But as global community, I think we have to do something. The problem is so big. But because of stigma, because of people cannot talk about it, and stigma and other things. Uh, so um, not only governments, but I think we should push governments to do something. But I think it can it should be done through movement and, and, and using the, those platforms. I love that you touched on using those platforms because COVID did teach us that you know, a lot of those mental health issues, not being allowed to see our loved ones, not being able to travel. And the one thing that did bring us together was turning, for me anyways, it was turning on Sunday football, being able to watch that while on FaceTime with my families all around the world where they were playing in empty stadiums. So definitely sport can play a huge role in that. Um, yes, over here. Hello, everybody. My question is, uh, actually, I have two questions for uh, but before the questions, I think everything is connected. Sport uh, nutrition is connected to mental health. Uh, despite the effect effect of uh, of sport and nutrition on mental health, we have to change some beliefs in people as well. To uh, again, in mental health, and maybe Doctor Mandy is a psychiatrist; he knows better than me about that. We have to change the the people's beliefs about sport and nutrition i am a tv presenter for the last uh, 10 years in a in the most popular tv show in in iraq my problem with adult people is that they cannot change it's, it's not easy to change they can change but it's not easy the problem is that they think that they they have to sleep every eight hours every every 20 uh, every 24 hours but they don't need to have exercises one one hour at uh, 24 hours one hour a day so we have, this is something cultural we have to change this my i have two questions uh, for um, his for her excellency uh, dr hanan the first is do you have a special um, health education program in in primary schools first second uh, how could you convince uh, your government to have a, spe a special special projects about health, sport, uh, focusing on nutrition, health in World Cup, for example? Is it 
uh, a strategy from the government or you could convince them. My question uh, to, to you as well as- I'm getting put on the hot seat. <laughs> okay, give it to That's me. That's question because you have two different countries. Qatar in, in our region is a very nice uh, model, successful in the world as well. But because Canada is very far from Qatar and you have two different countries, differences in, in many aspects. Do you have a special program in your uh, education, especially primary schools about health, about nutrition, about sports? Thank you. I'll let you thank go first. Yeah. Um, uh, first, uh, thank you very much for this question. Um, we do not have to convince governments. Um, our government is very enlightened on the importance of health and sports. And I wrote earlier some examples of that. Um, and uh, one of the programs, uh, another example, one of the programs that we're doing is um, we have a program called Health in All Policies. So um, uh, we have a process by which we promote health in every single policy that the country is, is taking. And that's an initiative we started with this national, uh, our, our current national health strategy and something that we will continue. Um, and, and this partnership, everything we're doing is built around um, having a population that is healthy physically and mentally. So this is an important priority for us as a country and we're happy to share with our region and across the world uh, our experiences. And um, uh, so that's that's number one. And um, uh, I think the second question was to me. <laughs> I, I can just speak on obviously my childhood and my family still living in Canada. Um, our government and parents there, I mean, we are always being active, whether it's from Vancouver all the way to Toronto, it's implemented in our blood in Canada. And I don't know why that is. I mean, it's minus 50 and we're outside doing something, literally freezing to death. And my mom's like, get outside um, as a small child playing football, shoveling snow off my football field in order to play high school. Uh, soccer after school. Um, so that's something within Canada. I think we were just born into it, a very lucky country where um, it's a new country, but we have a lot of access to a lot of things. We have a lot of different cultures there as well, which I was very lucky to grow up in. Um, but then also my parents, I mean, my dad played professional ice hockey. So I think maybe that played a little bit of a role in it on how important both nutrition, sleep, being active, um, whether that was just going to the playground, going for a bike ride. I mean, I was outside all the time. So now for someone like me, I think it really involves the parents educating our youth in order to be active. I know I have two small boys and we're, I mean, not that I don't allow watching Disney or tablets, but we're always outside, whether it's 101 degrees in Miami or we're in Maine, England, uh, visiting our family. I mean, my kids are literally always outside. And this is why I don't have to work out some days because they keep me active. But I think it really um, revolves around adults being educated in, in all of these aspects, the, the mental well-being, the nutrition, the physical activity in order to be able to teach our kids, our youth, being a teacher and just how important it is culturally. Um, and I think, again, that comes from, you know, the olds to the young to the grassroots and just being able to pass that on through generation through generation. How did I do for my first question? <laughs> All right. Last one, because we got to wrap it up. We'll take the one in the, the far back there. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, let me introduce. I'm Dr. Javed. Uh, I'm a general surgeon from Afghanistan. Uh, it is a great uh, moment that I'm here, and the topic of this conference was completely interesting for me. And it was also very interesting when I'm seeing a lot of successful people here selling, and also, especially when uh, Mr. Dogba says, uh, "I'm I, my plan was how to." Burn the calories. Um, I came from a country that I don't know the president of the WHO knows that we have about 20% of poverty and looking for calories, not burning the calories. We also have so much material about nutrition that they are talking about nutrition. So this is a big deal. So also we have to have so many athletes and also heroes and in, in, in worldwide. My question is going on that, especially what do you think? Is there any policy to have? A mentally and physically healthy society like Afghanistan, because I don't know countries like Afghanistan, because nowadays there's many other countries that as an example with Afghanistan. Thank you so much. Who would like to answer this one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Perfect. No, it's it's 
it's true when um, we talk about um, you know people who need to be physically active because they may have access to more calories uh, but at the same time there are many parts of the world a big part actually where uh, uh, there is uh, not just less calorie but let's name it famine even that if you take that extreme there are places where there is famine there is place lots of people are uh, you know uh, uh, hungry um, and i think the estimate is around a billion so um there should be of course a balance in in our messages and uh, um, that's why earlier i said if you go to the country level it, it depends on the country situation uh, what your situation is uh, and then based on your country situation take action but not only at, at, at country level, by the way, even you will not bring me one country that will be homogeneous uh, throughout, even though wealthiest country will have the, uh, you know, huge disparity and inequality where you need, where some kids are affected by malnutrition, while others could be, their problem could be obesity. So that's why the tailored approach is, is very, very important. And for Afghanistan, the same. Then when it comes to Afghanistan, I think it's um, uh, it's a political problem that uh, uh, is causing it both uh, internal political problem, but also geopolitics. It was trapped in, in a geopolitical rivalry, and we, we all know it. Um, so the internal politics is unhealthy, is destroying the country. Uh, and the geopolitics, geopolitical rivalry also destroying the country and destroyed the country, to be honest. And this has to be resolved. And my understanding is Afghanistan alone cannot, cannot solve this. Um, of course, it, it should, it, it, uh, you know, and it, ha it's ha it has to address its internal problems because cleaning is inside out, as you know, when you clean a wound, for instance, it is from inside out. So the internal problems has to be addressed by the Afghanis themselves. But at the same, the world should also give its due attention to Afghanistan because the damage that has happened is not just because of internal problems alone, but it, it was because of external serious um, battles and using Afghanistan as a battleground. Uh, so the problem is complex and it has to be uh, addressed as such. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you guys so much for all the questions. I know that there's a lot more questions, but we're unfortunately out of time. So um, I can't wait to come out of retirement and see you in Paris. Can't wait to see you guys in Qatar to cover the world's best game. Um, I'm snowboarding in Colorado with you. Yes. Because I thought it was good. Apparently not. And then we'll be playing some keepy ups at the Bell and Door tomorrow night. Um, again, thank you guys all for joining us. We know it's a, it's a little bit hot in here, but we really do appreciate it. And from all of you guys, uh, thank you.